Today's reading is taken from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, may your name be revered as holy. May his king, may your kingdom come. May give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. This is the word of the Lord. Before I start the sermon, really, I think about it. You may notice that the version of the Lord's Prayer that was used there is different. I quite deliberately chose a modern translation because it puts it in a different way. But you also need to be aware that Matthew doesn't put the doxology at the end of the prayer. And the Roman Catholics to this day do not put that at the end of the Lord's Prayer. They stop where where this one stops. Later on, we will have what Henry VIII insisted on in all public prayer, which is the doxology at the end of the Lord's Prayer. But if you don't know what the doxology is, you will when you hear the Lord's Prayer in a little while. So, a little bit of history in that for you. You have Henry VIII to blame for it being in public worship. He prefers, I can't prefer if it was Mark or Luke, but the other, the other version. I want to start the series, really, with, a, with a, what I think might be an outlandish statement, really. All people, absolutely all people, regardless of ability or disability, regardless of their ability to comprehend or not, have an inbuilt desire to have a relationship with God. Let that sink in. There is no one alive that does not have an inbuilt desire to have a relationship with God. Without it, we are incomplete. Our life is incomplete without a relationship with God. I regularly see this slogan on people's WhatsApp. You know when you see the WhatsApp come up and it says, I'm here, or some such silly comments... The one I've seen recently quite often, living my best life. It's arrogant to start with, but we'll come to that at another time. Living my best life. They're only living their best life if God is at the centre of it. Otherwise, they're not meeting the desire that was built into them at creation. God designed us. He made us to be a creature that has relationship with him. If you want to know what the difference between us and the animals are, is that we have a conscious relationship with God or not. And we can choose that. I'm not saying whether animals go to heaven. I'm not going to get into that debate. But I am trying to tell you that that is what makes us different from the other animals. Because we are an animal. doesn't matter what you want to think about us. We are flesh and blood. But the thing that makes us unique is the desire to worship God. When I've done baptism visits in the past, one of my favourite questions to them is, you don't go to church, there is no evidence of a Christian life, why do you want your child baptised? In the past, we'd get told, because granny wants it. And I would say, then don't do it course they're going to do it mostly because I said don't do it but they're still going to do it because they're scared of granny or mum said sometimes it's been dad but very rarely and I disregard that answer as a general rule and say yes but why do you want your child to be baptized and the fellows at this point begin to get uncomfortable because they can see their partner getting uncomfortable. But eventually, and quite regularly, she says, well, I don't know, but there's something in here that says it's the right thing to do. I said, so you don't go to church, you have no Christian life. 
but something in you tells you that it's right to present your child to God and say, make this child one of yours. That's modern women and modern men. They would deny that they have a part of them that calls for God. But I am telling them, and I tell anyone, there is a part of everyone that longs for God. And sometimes when you meet these truly hideous people that, are, that you might declare are evil, the reason they might be evil is they filled their heart with evil to try and replace the need for God. It's for us to help them see that God is the answer. Now, when I'm saying God, I'm deliberately saying something without gender. And it's quite important in our modern world. We have an intensity in that desire. You may not realize it, but how often have you heard somebody say, oh, thank God for that? It's not accidental. It's not just part of the language. It is part of the language, but it's not just that. It is something from the heart saying, I need a relationship with God. People are unaware of it very often, but they have this requirement to have a relationship with the Creator. And the nearest human equivalent is if you take an orphan, how many of them search and search and search for a parent? And if some of you are orphans, I'm sorry to use your situation as a reference, but it's the nearest I could find. We search for a relationship with, the, with our Creator. I think most of us, though, thirst for the same relationship with Jesus. When we become Christians, that is what we're doing, thirsting for a relationship with Jesus. How many of you were told to pray the sinner's prayer when you wanted to become a Christian? God, forgive me for what I've done and come into my heart are the essences of it. Although the words might have been Jesus or Holy Spirit, depending on who was leading you to Christ. For those of you that were born into Christian homes and would say that you've not had a conversion experience, and there are many people that that applies to, I would say to you, no, that may be true, but there is a time when you first became aware that you were praying to God and not just doing something. And that is the moment that your relationship became personalised. I think we thirst for a relationship with God. So how does that happen? Well, should we listen to Jesus? Always seems to me to be a, a good idea. Let's listen to Jesus. When you pray, said Jesus, address God as you would your parent, Abba, Father. And might I be controversial and say, mothered also because God incorporates the masculine and the feminine. And as I hinted at earlier, not everybody finds it easy to see God as masculine. But if we are to speak to God as a parent, he would of course be the best of parents, the very best in the world. And isn't it amazing that you can have a relationship with the very best. So I want to start this series on prayer with thinking about the image of God. And over the weeks we'll move through some of the challenges people of today experience in their relationship with God. And if you say to me, but Paul, some of these relationships and some of these issues aren't in the Bible, that's cool. Then they may not be. But then again, neither am I. And the problems I face in day-to-day -day life are not recorded in the Bible, at least not explicitly. No one ever had a broken-down car in the Bible. I haven't, as it happens, but it's an, nobody ever had their email go into the wrong address. 
in the Bible, but we have it all the time in the church, it seems. There are problems of today that are not recounted in the Bible. And perhaps we're also, because of communication, more aware of things that people of previous generations were not aware of. So we have Abba, Father. Treat God as a parent, the best of parents. Not like your own parents, but like the best of parents. The first thing I notice about Jesus when he prays is, it's personal. It's personal, and some of the things are private. If you look at the Gospel of Luke, you'll find that Jesus is frequently referred to as praying and almost always in isolated places. I don't know how Jesus prayed in the isolated places. He could have walked up and down and shouted and screamed. Or he could have been on his knees. I don't know. I wasn't there. What I do read from that, though, is he took time to pray. And that's the essential part of it. Many of us live altogether two privatised lives in general. But nonetheless, he took time to pray. We all know he prayed in public. But he took time to pray alone. So that's personal prayer. Your prayer can be as personal and as private as you want it to be if you choose the right location for your prayer. But Jesus does pray in public, but there's nearly always an agenda to that type of prayer. Matthew introduces the Lord's Prayer with the instructions from, from Jesus, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. It allows your relationship with God to be intimate. Absolutely intimate. Because that's what it should be. Your prayer should be intimate. You're going to find I refer to the Lord's Prayer quite a lot during this series. Because it is the way that Jesus told us to pray. And it's only this particular part of it. It's very, very simple. We don't have to get complicated. If it's complicated and you're struggling to do it, then you probably are not doing what your heart is telling you to do. Pray as your heart leads you. If you're in relationship with Jesus, your heart will lead you right. We need to remember that even in our private prayer life, it doesn't sit outside of culture, though. In other words, all the problems of the everyday world will impinge on your prayer life. And sometimes they should, and sometimes they shouldn't. I think it was entirely appropriate that we prayed for the election, that justice was done, that people were able to vote in safety, that was entirely appropriate publicly and privately. I'm not sure that praying for England to win tonight, which is very much on many people's minds, I've had several people tell me over the last few days, you will be praying for us, won't you? The answer is no, I'll be shouting just the same as you. <laughs> But being on our own, allowing God to lead our prayer, seems to me to be an appropriate way. Except, sometimes when I go to pray and I'm on my own, and I'm willing to be free-flowing and let it just happen, my mind goes blank. Well, that's when having something that you pray regularly really helps. 
It could be the Lord's Prayer. Everybody thought, when they knew my mum, that she was a Pentecostal Christian and very, very charismatic. Yet when she died in her bed cabinet, I found a rosary and an Anglican book of prayers. And it was quite clear from the amount of usage it had that at times, when she couldn't find the words, she had gone back to what she knew as a young person. There's no harm in any of those things. There is no harm in having a prayer that helps you get going. I have seen prayer do remarkable things. A young lady at the YMCA who couldn't sleep, and her life was a mess, and probably because she could never sleep. And we went away just for a few days. And being a, a sort of vaguely insomniacal person, I would have been up late and I'd noticed that she hadn't gone to sleep because the light was on. And the next morning she was clearly tired. So I said to her, why are you tired? And she said, well, I didn't sleep. I said, how long is it since you slept? Actually expecting the answer of a week, maybe, or something like that. She said, can't remember when I ever slept through the night. So I took her to one of those prayers. It's, in, it's one in the Anglican prayer book. And I lay my head down to rest. As it starts with. I said, pray that before you go to bed and see if it helps. The next morning she was quite lively and I asked her why. She said, well, I slept. I said, okay. So what are you going to do about it? She says, I'm going to enjoy myself. I said, great. What are you going to do about the prayer, though? She said, I think I might say it again. I said, great. Move forward seven or eight years. She's in a relationship with someone. She's got children. I said to her, how's your sleep? She said, I still use that prayer. And I said, what does that do? She says, funny is, I find it easy to pray for my children when I've prayed that prayer. And that's the point I'm getting to. If you've got something that helps you get into prayer, Use it, and then you'll find your prayer is free-flowing. But as I was saying, I think we are all affected by what goes on in the world, particularly since 9-11. The Western world has been drawn into a world of chaos. And I use that word with deliberation. We have war in Europe. We never thought that would happen again in our lifetime, or we hoped it wouldn't. The NHS has been attacked possibly by the Russian state, certainly by hackers. We no longer can see ourselves as Britain as a little island that's strong and looks after itself. We're part of a global community, whether we like it or not. All these technologies bring us closer to the world around us, not further apart. Except in our personal lives. So on a global scale, technology moves us closer to each other. But in our private lives, technology actually isolates us. But it pretends to make us closer. It's at the core of our culture and our expectations. But do you know, as great as it is that we can instantly see the last moon landing, as wonderful as it is that we'll be able to see the football on any kind of device, when you see a couple sat at a dinner table in a restaurant and they're both on their devices, has technology brought them closer together or has it actually separated them? I don't want to sound old-fashioned because I really enjoy that technology. I love using it. But I think it can ruin our personal lives 
if we lose the ability to communicate with each other. And there is a sense in which if people are constantly on their devices, how are they praying? Which is obviously where I was going to go. If these things can get in the way of our relationship with each other, then we're certainly going to get in the way of our relationship with God. It's great that we can pick all these things up, the readings up on our phone. I saw John coming down with his reading on the phone. It's great. It's a good use of the technology. But if just looking at our technology takes up the time that we'd have prayed, the worst things are these reels, you know, with these little short clips of film. Nick, you probably don't know. <laughs> you don't like your handheld device much, do you, Nick? <laughs> That's fine. But the trouble is, the youngsters particularly spend hours watching them. Where's time left for God? And where's time left for each other? Because this is the strange thing about prayer. It's difficult to pray if our relationships with each other are poor. Because our mind will instinctively go to the things that are a problem. It's why we worship God first and then we put, put ourselves right. So that after that we can be right with each other and right with God. But one of the big problems of today, and I see it in our prayer lines. I won't criticise a prayer I heard said in public recently. I won't make it clear who it was. But it was calling for something to happen instantly, and not in God's time. And there's a problem with that in my mind. We live in a society of instant gratification. We were talking about this somewhere th this week as well. I think it might have been Thursday morning. Instant gratification. Actually, instant gratification, the desire for it is a primary sign of psycho psychopathy. That is, in other words, to be a psychopath. You must be have everything there and then. What does that say about our society? But our prayers are not about instant gratification. Our prayers are about worshipping God, about our relationship with him, and about him answering in his time. Yet we live in a society with all these ways of communicating and levels of loneliness and depression are rising. And I believe it's because we are not meeting that primary need within all of our bodies, within all of our minds. And I quite deliberately use body and mind there to have a relationship with God. I don't know if it's my dad, but it's from that long back in my life. Somebody said, there's a God-shaped jigsaw piece in all of us. And we are incomplete without that being filled. And nothing can feel right until that bit of us is fulfilled. Why do people go on and on and on, making billions and billions and billions and billions of pounds, driving themselves to the point of breakdown? It's because that bit of them that calls for God is not being answered. That's my solution to all of the world's problems. Ask God. You feel that you're under pressure at work, you feel that things are hard, that's, and they probably are, they're probably terribly hard. But have you taken time to ask God to help you deal with that pressure? Or have you felt under so much pressure that God has been pushed to the side? And before you think that doesn't happen to me, it really does. There are times when I find it harder to look at God than to look at the problem in front of me. It's only when I step back and see, is God in that problem? Is God the part that's missing? 
that I can help myself. We live in a very sceptical world. Call it cynical if you wish. And when I've been talking to people about Christ, I sometimes hear them say something to the effect of, what's in it for me? It's actually not a bad question. It might be a shocking question, but it's not a bad question. I'm not sure there are any bad questions, actually, but that most certainly is not a bad one. Because you can turn around and say, what's in it for you is the knowledge that you are loved by God and that you're accepted by God. And the knowledge that God working through you will bring about good ends. But you see, the world sees God in the same way as it asks questions, sceptically, as if God is absent, and in some cases they struggle with the descriptions that they've been given of God by people. We all describe God differently, but God is way beyond any of our descriptions. And so if you find you're talking to someone that says, I struggle with God as a man, or I struggle with God because. Be humble enough to tell them that your view of God is but one of ten billion over the years, and two or three billion of the world today. There are many views of God. There may be some basic truths, but there are many ways of understanding them. And one of the things I love about Genesis, bear in mind it was our last series, is it personalizes God. It's a very 21st century idea that we can have our own personal God. Actually, Johnny Cash sang about it in the last century, my own personal Jesus. But what he was trying to say is the way God talks to you is unique to you because of the God-shaped hole in you is different to the God-shaped hole in me. For some, we have that wonderful personal relationship of Adam and Eve walking in the garden. For Moses, it was was a talking bush that was on fire. And we have Jesus, the incarnation of God the reflection of the divine person of God. That's quite quite a thought, isn't it? That Jesus is a reflection of God. And we know that because Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So what are the human characteristics of God, of, of Christ, sorry, Think on them, because those human characteristics will give you something of the nature of God. He storms, he say, he stills the storm. On the other hand, he drives out the devil. There are many, many aspects of Christ. He's there to defend us, he's there to build us up. Look at the person of Christ and you'll get so much about God. Keep your eyes on God then. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Develop a trusting relationship with God through prayer. And as I've said, yes, we do pray publicly. And we love it when you pray in church. And God loves it when you pray in church. But it is in the privacy of your home or the place you find private to praying that you will build your personal relationship with Christ. 
for some people, as we heard, it's praying in the car, walking the dog. All sorts of places. And whatever you do, pray. Amen. Almighty God, our beloved and heavenly Father, we bow before you alone and we bless your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we welcome you, Lord. We welcome you in our hearts, in the very core of our beings. And we welcome you in this place, in this community, in this nation, across the nations and beyond. And we proclaim that you, Jesus Christ, the Lord, yours is the name above all names, towering above all names. You are mightier than we could ever imagine. You are beyond perfection. You are everything we could ever ask for and all that we need. And we trust you, Lord. And we thank you. And we offer you our lives afresh this morning. Come and have your way in us. May we work together as one, giving you the glory. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And Lord, we find ourselves in a time of change, a new government, and a football team, our football team, in the final. That's a time of change. And the world is changing so very fast, we cannot keep up with things. But we do not fear, Lord, because we trust you. And first and foremost, Lord, we pray for your church, your church across the nations. And remind us, Lord, that you only have one church, you only have one body with you as the head. Lord, may you work a new, a new thing in your church, uh, and a level of unity that's not been seen for many, many, many years. May you give us a deeper love for you and a deeper love for each other and a deeper desire to serve. Remind us that you call us to die to self, to live to you. And I don't know how it works, Lord, but somehow when we strive to do that, we become more of who you intended each one of us to be, unique, never to be repeated. Lord, we pray for those in church leadership, that you would strengthen them, Lord, that you would protect them, that you would deliver them from evil, that you would guide them, that you would pour your wisdom and discernment into them, and that they would have a clear vision, Lord, of leading your church. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, in the world, I want to pray for Keir Starmer, Lord, and I want to thank you for his government, Lord, and I pray that we as a people, whatever our political persuasion, would not forget to uphold our leader in prayer. Lord, I believe you're doing a new thing in politics. May we see an end in this country to the, to the constant fighting between parties. May there be a genuine desire to lead, to put the country first, Lord, and to work together when one party's in opposition and the other isn't. 
Lord, thank you that you've, you've shown how Rory Stewart and Alistair Campbell can have a great relationship and, and work wonders, Lord, with opposing views. Thank you for the love and respect they have for each other. May that love and respect be evident in all politicians, Lord, not just in our country, but across the world. And I want to thank you, Lord, for the number of young MPs there are this year. And I'm going to read them by name because you called them by name. I want to thank you for Sam Carling, for Josh Dean, for Ewan Stainback, Joshua Reynolds, Kia Matha, Rosie Writing, Jacob Collier, Nadia Witto, Lloyd Hatton, and Luke Charters. Lord, pair them up with people who can really mentor them well. And may those mentors see that they can learn from the young people too. Lord, um, do a work in our nation of, of, of putting p politics back in people's hearts. Don't let people think I'm not going to vote. I can't stand it. I can't, I don't know what I'm doing. Just work a miracle and use these young MPs to do that. Lord, thank you for the hope that there is in a new government. And particularly this morning, we want to lift to you the prison service, the education service, the health service, and social services, Lord, and invite you through those politicians and the people they work with to come and have your way, that you might restore and renew those areas. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, further afield, I want to thank you for Mazud Pezeshkian. I don't know if I've said that Lord, right, Lord, but you know his name. The president-elect in Iran. Lord, he's not... He's not a radical. He's more lenient. He wants a, a, a relationship with the West. Lord, we recognize your hand at work in him. And Lord, I pray that there would be relationships built across the East and West and North and South and wherever they need building. Lord, bring down the walls of hatred and racism and um, fear and just flood this planet with your love and your light. And may Iran once again rise up, Lord, to be the nation this time that you want it to be. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And Lord, closer to home in our community, we want to thank you for, for our community and the many ways in which your church serves the community. We want to lift to you reflections, Lord. And thank you for that group and the vision the group had over so many years. And we pray for the meeting, Lord, this Wednesday at two o'clock, Lord. And thank you for an opportunity for people to come together and uh, either do outdoor or indoor activities. Lord, may we be a people who don't just hear that, but go and invite people who can come. There are so many people, Lord, who would be blessed by reflections. May we not keep all the things that we have to ourselves, but invite others. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, this morning we think of Lucy, Mary's granddaughter, who's now in Borneo with her friends on her trip. And we ask that you would um, not only protect her, not only guide them and watch over them, but that you would reveal more of yourself to each one of the team. May they see wonderful things that shape them as people, not just the young people, but those adults who are with them. May they come back full of enthusiasm, um, full of wonder, awe and wonder at what they've seen of your creation. And may you touch each one of them while they're there, Lord, and bring them home safely. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And last, Lord, we lift uh, areas of service in, in your church to you and ask that you would right now touch those people who you are calling to serve you, whether it's by serving a cup of coffee, whether it's by welcome, whether it's by praying or reading, putting chairs out, clearing up, whatever it is. Lord, thank you for the gifts that you've given each one of the people here and the people who are watching online and people who didn't make it today. Lord, may we not hold on to our gifts. May we use them freely 
And Lord, as we do so, may we grow, may we grow in the knowledge of prayer, Lord. May our prayer lives um, really flourish as a result of this sermon series. May we pray in private, in public, any which way. May we never compare our prayers and never think anybody else's prayer is better than anybody else's. Because each one of our relationships with you is unique given by you. And you look down on everybody, Lord, just as you did in Genesis, and you say it's good. So Lord, hear our prayers and move amongst your people that many may be drawn to you. We ask that in the name of Jesus Christ. All our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Name above all names. Amen. Amen.